All right, so it's my pleasure to uh, welcome Andrew Flynn from uh, University College Cork, who will be talking about exploring multifunctionality in a, a reservoir computer. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so thanks for the very nice introduction. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm Andrew and uh, I'm a PhD student at UCC, University College Cork. Um, and I'm funded by the Irish Research Council uh, with under the Enterprise Partnership Scheme. So my enterprise partner is Collins Aerospace. And uh, my supervisors are Andrea Saman and Vasilios from UCC and Collins. And this talk will feature elements uh, from collaboration work with Yashka Oto and Christoph Wraith. And I suppose this talk has also really benefited from conversations I've had and work I'm doing as well with Andrea Cheney and, and David Fox and Exeter and UCC. So I should really have a maybe put a subheading uh, to the title, uh, it should say exploring multifunctionality in a reservoir computer so far. So the, the story is not complete yet. There's still a lot of work to do. Um, so the talk itself, um, just a little brief overview. Um, so I'll introduce the idea of multifunctionality from the biological perspective and how it can be translated to the artificial uh, world uh, and through the lens of reservoir computing. So I'll also introduce uh, the particular type of reservoir I, I've been uh, working with for the last while. Um, and the main results that I will show in this talk uh, you can find in these papers. So um, the first multifunctionality paper came out early this year. Uh, there's another paper then uh, with the work I've done with the guys in DLR, uh, Christoph and Yoshka, and that's under review in chaos. And there's another paper that I'm currently preparing, which also covers the idea of overlapping attractors in a multifunctional reservoir computer. And I'll just finish with some final remarks. So uh, what is multifunctionality? So it turns out that it's, well, it's a fundamental feature of certain biological neural networks and what it is, is that the network uh, can execute uh, a multitude of mutually exclusive tasks without the need of rewiring. So this picture uh, in this corner over here kind of tells us a lot about what's going on with the multifunctional neural network. You have uh, a bunch, you have a network of neurons and you have a particular input to the network and the network will perform task A. If you change the input, then the same network will also perform task B. So whenever you hear the word multifunctionality throughout this talk, um, all you need to really think about is that it's a single network that can perform many tasks. And how it does it is its neural dynamics differ on the demand of a given duty. So it's quite well documented in nature. Uh, one of the uh, nice examples is this medicinal leech. Um, so it's thought originally that this leech could only crawl uh, and as its environmental conditions changed, it also needed to learn how to swim. It didn't have a whole bunch of neurons uh, and kind of one of the prevailing uh, ideas in neuroscience was that each time uh, we learn a new task, uh, there's a new network that is associated with that task. But what happens if you don't have a lot of neurons? Well, um, those neurons need to adapt and learn the new task. So that's kind of one of the ideas that um, how multifunctionality came into uh, being a fundamental part of the uh, medicinal leech. And similarly with the uh, European lobster, there's a multifunctional neural network which controls the switching between its chewing and swallowing motion. And it's happening in us all the time in our pre-Botzinger complex. Here is a, a multifunctional neural network, which was responsible for instigating the switching between regular breathing, which is eupneic breathing, sighing or gasping. So that network, it's a single network that can perform three tasks. So the question I was interested in was, can an artificial neural network be trained to exhibit multifunctionality? And when you start thinking about it from a dynamical systems perspective, things begin to make a little bit more sense. And what you could say about a multifunctional neural network is it has more than one stable mode of operation. And from a dynamical systems perspective, what we would say is that the multifunctional neural network resembles a multistable system. And each task would resemble a different attractor in the network state space. 
So if we move from the picture uh, of the multifunctional neural network to a multi-stable dynamical system, you could say that they're pretty analogous uh, to one another. If you have a, a dynamical system uh, and you initialize it with a certain initial condition in the basin of attraction of attractor A, the system will tend towards attractor A, change the initial condition, it will go to the other attractor, attractor B. So for an artificial neural network to exhibit multifunctionality, what we should say is that it must be trained to facilitate a coexistence of attractors. And this picture here is kind of what we're hoping to achieve today. And I explored this problem using the reservoir computing approach to machine learning. Uh, so like I said, it's a machine a reservoir computer is a type of machine learning uh, approach and it has many applications just to give uh, a few examples in uh, vocal and image recognition problems, hidden variable observation, predicting critical transitions. You know, I could go on here for another while, but uh, I think uh, what is mo the particular application of reservoir computing that has been probably, which is most uh, applicable to the idea of multifunctionality is in reconstructing time series or so reconstructing calic attractors. And this is what the reservoir computer is really, really good at. It can be trained to mimic a trajectory on a chaotic attractor. So if I told you here that this, so if I train the reservoir uh, on data from the Lawrence attractor, and if you look at this picture, uh, you can see how well the prediction fall, uh, re, uh, can, of the reservoir can reconstruct the Lawrence attractor. And if you didn't know that the orange trajectory here was uh, from a machine learning uh, from a neural network, you would think that uh, it's simply uh, the Lorentz system initialized with a different initial condition. So this is what they say when they reconstruct the climate of the attractor. It follows the long-term behavior. It has a pretty good short-term prediction, but also into the long-term, it doesn't fly off to infinity. The uh, prediction will decay, but it will follow a similar trajectory to the actual Lorentz attractor. Uh, from uh, another kind of angle in which the reservoirs are uh, kind of uh, good to use uh, is that it's also a dynamical system. So I won't dive too much into the, into the details yet of, of, of what these uh, parameters are, but this is what how you can represent a reservoir. It's a dynamical system. And that means that we have a much greater opportunity to understand how the machine learns with a mathematical rigor, which is a huge problem in machine learning, how, how what's actually going on if you look under the hood, as they say. So when seen as the, the, uh, the neural network is, is a dynamical system, we were able to use all our nuts and bolts from, from dynamical systems theory to understand how the learning takes place. We can talk about state space, stability, attractors, bifurcations, and chaos. So. Yeah, it, it's the reservoir computer is, is kind of ideal if you want to gain a greater understanding of how the machine learns because it's a dynamical system itself. So therefore, with all this in mind, the aim is now to train a single reservoir computer to become multifunctional. And the particular task we're going to focus on is imitating the dynamics of different chaotic attractors based on a given input. So training the reservoir to be able to perform more than one task. So following the dynamics of a, a given attractor based on how you initialize it. When uh, you want, if you want to draw a reservoir or if you want to uh, take a look at what reservoirs look like, there's many different uh, uh, ways in which you can build them, but um, you can have even physical reservoir computers, but from a neural networks perspective, uh, you could have uh, a reservoir computer would typically look like this, whereby you have three different layers. You have your input layer, your reservoir layer, and your output layer. And what's interesting about the reservoir computing approach to machine learning is that you only need to train the output layer, of course. But your uh, input layer and your hidden layer, they, they need to have some specific characteristics, in particular, your, your reservoir. Um, and throughout this talk, the particular type of reservoir I was working with uh, typically had about a thousand neurons and the site of the reservoir at a given time t is represented by R and the connections between the neurons are represented through this adjacency matrix M and I only investigated uh, one type of topology in, in the context of multifunctionality 
there's obviously a scope to investigate more topologies. Uh, and it's this sparse Erdos Rene topology, which means you have a whole bunch of random or assigned weights which loosely couple neurons. And uh, the idea is that uh, you would have a dynamically rich response to a given input. So you already have a few parameters here. You have your number of neurons, you have the sparsity of the network, and you have the uh, random initialization of the weights. So what normal distribution do you want to draw from? I would have I drawn from minus one to plus one. And the kind of main parameter uh, that people focus on in terms of reservoir computing, of course, is the spectral radius of the reservoir. So it's the largest eigenvalue of this matrix, which incorporates this notion of memory into the system. So uh, it's chosen such that the input, the driving input into the reservoir can echo around uh, for a while. And uh, it's gonna be a key parameter throughout the results of this talk. So when you're training the reservoir, it's this drive response system, which I had about a few moments ago. And what happens is your input is projected into the reservoir through this uh, input layer to drive a response from the reservoir. And this is a dynamical system, continuous time. Uh, so you compute solutions of this with Runga Kota. And when you're training the system, there's a little bit of a warm up time involved. So you would drive the reservoir uh, with data uh, up until some time T listen and discard uh, that data. And then you only start to store your training data after that. And the idea is that the state of the reservoir at that time will not resemble its initial condition and it will become synchronized to the input in some sense. So you would then collect the data of the reservoir's response to the given input from time t listen up until some time t train. And the aim here is to find an output matrix to replace the input to the reservoir. And we would have, we would go from the open loop system to the closed loop system. So we want to replace the input with the readout layer. And the aim is that the state of the reservoir will continue to look like the driving input from before. So to do this, I would use a ridge regression and this W out matrix, which corresponds to the readout layer uh, is calculated using this expression where the X and Y are the matrices made up of this Q function and the input data. So um, this Q, so in it's kind of becoming a standard practice to break the symmetry in the reservoir um, because there's some unwanted consequences if you don't. I'll, I'll talk about that later, of course. And the symmetry breaking technique that I would use is that when I'm computing the solutions of the reservoir during the training, I would also store the squares of the states. So this Q function just stacks the squared states of the reservoir beneath it. And the other parameters here are the regularization parameter used in the ridge regression and I as identity. So after you've done the training, you've computed this W out matrix using the data from the input and the reservoir's response to that. And you then would replace the input with W out and Q to form the readout layer and you would have your closed loop system. So you're going from the non-autonomous to the autonomous system. And for instance, if you were to train the reservoir using data from the Lawrence attractor, your prediction would then look like this. So you, uh, your, your input from before is now represented as W out times Q. And that's what you see on the screen here. That's the output from the reservoir. So, uh, the reservoir, it does a pretty good job of being trained to imitate the dynamics of some desired attractor. So what about two different attractors? So this is the context of multifunctionality now. So in the current picture, we would have, if we were to train the system with data from one attractor and then train it from, with data from the other attractor, we would have the same M and W in matrix, but we would get different W outs in order to reconstruct the individual attractors what we would like from the perspective of multifunctionality, of course, is to have the same M, W in and W out. So a single network that is used to reconstruct either attractor. So depending on how I initialize the reservoir, I will end up on one attractor or the other. And to do this, I use this blending technique. So what happens here is 
I train the reservoir using the techniques I just showed um, on data from one attractor and gather all that data in this X matrix and the corresponding input in the Y matrix, go back to time equaling zero and uh, do the same process for the other time series and store them as follows. I would then concatenate and weight both of these matrices together to form one bigger matrix. And I would weight them with this blending parameter alpha. So the idea of this is that when alpha is equal to zero, I would only see data from a tractor S2. When alpha is equal to one, I would only see, the reservoir would only see data from a tractor S1. So the idea is that we will, so we, we calculate W out uh, using these matrices. And the aim is that there will be some alpha which will give rise to a multifunctional reservoir computer. So some blending of both data sets together will give us this multifunctional output matrix. And most of the results in the seminar are generated using this technique. It had to be adapted for one result later on in the talk, but we'll come to that later. So uh, to test the limits of this technique, um, I explored different scenarios in which the reservoir was trained to exhibit multifunctionality. So what about your choice of S1 and S2? Well, a good place to start is if S1 and S2 are already coexisting chaotic attractors by some known dynamical system. So what I did was I took this system from the literature and for a given uh, set of parameters and a set of initial conditions, this system has a set of coexisting chaotic attractors and this will be my input to the reservoir for the training. So the aim is now to train the reservoir, a single reservoir computer to be able to uh, predict or follow or reconstruct the climate, reconstruct the dynamics of both attractors. And to do this, we need to find the middle ground between the parameters. So different attractors may be naturally salute, uh, suited towards different uh, values of rho or, or the other parameters. So we also need to find the right blending or mixing of the data. So I took a, a grid search approach to be able to find the pair of alpha and rho parameters, which would give me what I wanted, which is a, a W out matrix, which, which, which could predict both attractors. So if you do the training uh, using the data from attractor A1 and A2, get your W out alpha matrix and look at the long-term behavior of the reservoir as it's initialized with data from attractor A1 and data from attractor A2, you can see where it ends up. So the blue points in this picture tell you for a given alpha and rho where the prediction, what happened to the prediction in the long term. So if it's blue, it means that you remained on the precise attractor. If it's purple, it means you decayed to the other attractor. If you go to a yellow color, it means that the prediction decayed to a limit cycle. And then if it's green, it means that for this pair of parameters, your prediction of the attractor, A1, pretended, tended to a fixed point. Similarly, same thing here for the other attractor. So initially what you could see is that the reservoir has kind of, is probably more suited to learning attractor A2. There's a greater amount of blue points in this picture, um, but there's many non-trivial transitions between reconstruction and modes of failure, right? So um, sometimes you would, it, it's, it's kind of, it's not quite clear as to where you would end up sometimes. Um, but typically for these low row values, you would tend towards some fixed point. And of course you see the uh, predicted outcome whereby if alpha is one, that means your, the reservoir is trained with data from only attractor A1. And if alpha is zero, then the reservoir is trained on data from only attractor A2. So that's confirmation that the blending parameter works. And if you take the common blue area from the two previous figures, you get the regions of multifunctionality in this alpha row picture. So if I pick a point in this plane, it means that I'll have a multifunctional matrix. So if you plot the actual attractor and the uh, say task specific uh, trained W out. So if you train on data from only, if you forget about the blending technique and train in the traditional setup, uh, this trajectory is the orange and then the W out alpha matrix or so the multifunctional matrix uh, are the green uh, trajectories. So what you see here is that the two predicted outcomes both map the climate of the reservoir, 
but this W at alpha is able to predict both. So can we get a little bit more creative with our choice of S1 and S2? How about attractors from two different systems? So what I, I did next was I used the training data from the Lawrence attractor and the previous attractor A2, and I did the blending technique and apply the same procedure as before to find the regions of multifunctionality. We find that the reservoir is well able to do this. So there's quite a broad amount of points here in these alpha role plane that will get you a multifunctional uh, reservoir computer. So the reservoir is able to reconstruct attractors, simultaneously reconstruct attractors from different systems. So you can think of this as, as a new application area for reservoir computers. So another question I was interested in was um, what happens when things fail, right? So it's just as important to understand uh, the, out, the training outcome when it fails as it is to when it works successfully. But even further, it's even more important if you, so if you train the reservoir successfully, can it still tend towards some undesirable behavior? So what I did next was I picked a point where I had multifunctionality and observe the resultant trajectories from many random initial conditions. And what you see here is that depending on, so I've trained the reservoir uh, using the blending technique and I've picked a point where I get multifunctionality. So I'll get the, the, the reservoir will evolve for a certain set of initial conditions on attractor A1 and for another set of initial conditions will evolve along attractor A2. And so this is the X3 variable in the, the predict the reconstructed variable of the of the uh, of the reservoir. And what you see here is that for many other random initial conditions, you wind up on this fixed point, FP1. So e even though we've trained the reservoir to become multifunctional, there's actually another attractor which exists behind the scenes that we didn't know about. And what happens if you apply more weight to attractor A2? Well, there's a bistability here of uh, another attractor, FP2. Uh, which you see here, so many random initial conditions wind up on this other fixed point. Then if you apply more weight to attractor A1, you see a similar picture occurring where you have another fixed point in, the, in, uh, in closer to attractor A1, which we call FP3. So some little observations here. What we find basically is that there are additional attractors populating the prediction state space and they weren't in the training, right? So, so we call them the untrained attractors. What it does is that it, it, it demonstrates that the reservoir, even though we've trained it successfully, it can still tend towards some undesirable behavior, right? And this has many analogies to certain neurological disorders. From a dynamical assistance perspective, what this says is that a small change in alpha can give rise to a bistability of untrained attractors, which seeds in this notion of behind the scenes bifurcations. So, uh, even though we train the reservoir on these particular dynamics of two chaotic attractors, there's actually, and if you change the parameters, sometimes you would fail in your reconstruction, sometimes you would get the reconstruction of both. But actually, as well, on top of those dynamics, there are some behind the scenes bifurcations of these untrained attractors. So, what I did next was I tracked the evolution of these untrained attractors with respect to alpha. And you see that they actually form a continuum. Uh, there's a branch of these fixed points. So when you do this track and trace, uh, you're able to find the extent to which these fixed points exist. And there's many, so with this algorithm I have, I can track the unstable branches, but ordinarily there will be unstable branches connecting these branches of stable fixed points. There's a hysteresis cycle involved here. So if you're tracking FP2, and if you can no longer track, you will end up on FP1. And if you reverse the trend of alpha, will fall down to the branch FP2 and so on. And these black dots over here, I'll come to this in a moment. So what these are, are the failed predictions of the attractor A1. So what you see here for uh, alpha being zero, you wind up on some fixed point. So this is when you train the reservoir, the multifunctional reservoir, and you're not initializing from random initial conditions anymore. You're initializing precisely from the last point in the training data. Uh, to reconstruct, to continue the evolution of the training data. And when there's no uh, data being presented to the reservoir of this particular attractor, you tend to this fixed point as you slightly begin to increase the amount of weight that the training for attractor A1 receives. 
these fixed points, they start to tend closer towards the uh, actual attractor until eventually you're able to reconstruct it. What you also see here is an occurrence of where the prediction switches to their attractor. But if you plot these fixed points, they actually fall onto these branches here. So these are the untrained attractors. So what's more is that these branch endpoints, they look like connecting. So are there some cusp bifurcations occurring? So when you go into the code, uh, when you start varying the row parameter here, so this is uh, telling us that the branches do connect at different row values. And that means that there's some code dimension two bifurcations taking place. So what else can we uncover for other values of row? Well, when you spend a bit more time uh, going on for the full bifurcation analysis of the reservoir, you might think this is some Picasso painting, but uh, there's a lot of stuff going on here. Um, what this says is that basically where a failed prediction may tend towards. So this is a picture telling us what are the untrained attractors in the alpha row plane. In gray, you have one fixed point. In blue, you have two fixed points. And in orange, you have three fixed points. And these little tails here are the cost bifurcations you just saw. And there's a lot going on in this picture but I suppose the most interesting part of it is down here in the bottom right hand corner. Uh, so what you have here is a route to chaos. So this is quite interesting. Um, you have an untrained chaotic attractor behind the scenes. Uh, if you track and trace this fixed point FP6 and it undergoes a half bifurcation. So this is the maximum and minimum values of the limit cycle, which is born here. And if you roll the tape, you will see the period doubling route to chaos. So this is quite neat. Um, while we train the reservoir on data from two different, on attractor A1 and attractor A2, there's actually a completely different chaotic attractor which exists behind the scenes, which is quite weird. So I mentioned previously about this, this Q function. So symmetry in the reservoir computer is, it's a well-known property and it, it kind of hinters prediction outcome or the computational capabilities of the reservoir. So the idea is oftentimes to break the symmetry. And this is the reason for including this square term. So when you look at the readout matrix, when you multiply W out times Q, you, what you would actually have is inside this trained readout matrix, you would have two submatrices, which I call W1 and W2 which would correspond to the linear terms and the square terms. So that's why they're called the linear readout matrix and the square readout matrix. So uh, this is uh, uh, just giving you some insight into the situation if you didn't use the squares. So you would have um, the reservoir, the trained reservoir would be entirely symmetric. And that means that it's invariant under the inversion of the sign. So if I swapped OR with minus OR, that implies that uh, there would be a symmetric partner for all solutions of this system. So to use the terminology developed by Yoshka and Kristoff, um, what that means is that for any attractor A in the reservoir state space, there is a corresponding mirror attractor, A prime, and the linear readout results in pairs of mirrored attractors appearing in the projected prediction state space. So the question we were interested in was what happens when the reservoir is specifically trained to reconstruct pairs of mirror attractors? Well, I have a question. Um, so, hi Lou. Um, so the, the symmetries, um, uh, the natural symmetry in this equation here, um, if you, it's, it's inversion under the sign, okay? So if you if you swap or with minus or, you get the same thing. So I wonder, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does, thanks. Can you hear me? Yeah, hi Lou, how's it going? Thanks. Oh, good, thank you. Uh, yeah, just a short comment that maybe just use a reservoir that doesn't have that symmetry. True, true. But um, if I, yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, it's still exposing an interesting property of, of the continuous time reservoir. Um, and it's, it's still worth studying. 
Okay, thank you. Okay, so the so this this reservoir uh, has an actual symmetry in it, and it proves to be problematic at times. And uh, Yashka and Christoph explored this quite extensively: how to break the symmetry to improve the prediction. And we came together then and worked on multifunctionality. So what happens? So the question we were interested in was what happens when the reservoir is specifically trained to reconstruct pairs of mirror attractors. Uh, so here you have the Lawrence attractor and its mirror attractor represented by L and L prime. If you use uh, this as your training data to, the multi, uh, to train a reservoir to become multifunctional, what happens is that even though you use this squaring technique, the symmetry of the training data kills the square. So that, that was the theme of our uh, of our collaboration. And remember, W out is calculating using calculated using this ridge regression. And based on this um, expression here, we can see that if this is presented with anti-symmetric data uh, in the x and y matrices, and this data has this specific format where they are after in columns. Uh, it becomes the negative of itself. And similarly with, so the training data and the reservoir's response to the input, we have this picture where the first in columns are um, the positive, are, are the actual attractor and the next in columns are the mirror attractor. We have this property. And when you solve or go through the algebra, you will see that uh, what happens because of this it's, it's unavoidable, it's analytic, that when, how the symmetry kills the square. So when you uh, compute y times xt and x times xt, you look at these expressions, which then results in the expression for w out, which means that the linear terms, so the linear readout matrix will always have this format and the square readout matrix will not appear. So that means whenever uh, the training data has this particular format, w2, is prevented from coming into existence. And we show that here uh, numerically. So um, this is the behavior of W2 when the reservoir is trained specifically on the Lawrence attractor and its mirror attractor. You see here that uh, the, the weights of the trained matrix, they only appear for W1 terms and they don't appear for W2. And if you break the conditions, then W2 is allowed to come into existence. So we just sh slightly shift the location of the mirror attractor, which is enough for W2 to come, to come out. And as you continue shifting the, um, the mirror attractor, there is a greater response from W2 as the symmetry becomes broken even further. You can then also do this with four overlapping Lawrence attractors. So uh, when you increase uh, the amount of attractors, the, the result still holds when they're perfectly symmetric. So here we have pairs of mirrored attractors. W2 is still zero. It's still prevented from coming into existence. And if we slightly shift the location of only one of these attractors and break the symmetry, it's enough for W2 to come about again. So this overlap is interesting, right? What's actually happening here uh, when we have overlapping training data? So uh, since the reservoir is a dynamical system, there can be no intersections of solutions in state space, right? And that kind of conflicts with our current idea of what multifunctionality is. So we need to improve our description. And what will hopefully become apparent throughout the remainder of the talk is that a multifunctional reservoir computer creates a multi-stability of attractors in its state space, such that when these attractors are projected to the prediction state space, the attractors resemble the desired behavior. So there's this, this can deal with overlap, this, this description of multifunctionality. So to how I'm, how I'm able to make that statement, of course, is realizing that this is the case through my results. So uh, what we consider doing next was 
training the reservoir to reconstruct a coexistence of two overlapping circular orbits, which rotate in opposite directions. So a very simple problem, but by virtue of the simplicity involved in this setup, we are able to place a greater emphasis on examining what are the necessary conditions for multifunctionality to occur in the reservoir computer. So this is our setup. Um, I generate uh, trajectories along two, two cycles, CA and CB, which rotate in opposite directions using uh, uh, just using cosine and sine. And I can shift the location of the centers of these cycles with this X sin and Y sin parameter. So uh, to rotate counterclockwise, I have SX and SY both set to be positive. And then by changing the sign here of SX, then I go in the opposite direction. So you can see here that uh, if the radius is five, then therefore if X sin is equal to 5.5, then the circles are not overlapping. But when I change the change X sin to be three, so less than the radius, I'll get overlap. So this is the problem. And to avoid an attractor merging crisis, the, the future evolution of the reservoir on the desired outputs, it cannot be solely dependent on its current state, which really brings rho into, in, into consideration here, which is the memory parameter. So, so the reservoir must have a sufficient knowledge of its previous states in order to remain on the correct path. So for instance, if I train the reservoir on data from both cycles here in this case, and they're overlapping. Well, when you're predict when you're on on a trajectory of one circle, and you're approaching this crossing point, the reservoir needs to know that it's meant to continue following uh, this circular trajectory, because when it's approaching this crossing, if it if it blew it it's it needs to have a sufficient amount of knowledge to remain on its on its correct path and not fall onto the other attractor and go on say a figure of eight shape. So, so rho is going to be a, a key parameter to investigate here in terms of can we get multifunctionality in these interesting scenarios of overlap. And what I did next was explore the regions of multifunctionality in the X in row plane. So I increased the amount of overlap by changing X in and I changed the memory with rho. And similarly to, to before, when you uh, use the blending technique, so here I set alpha to be 5, 0.5 to give equal weight. And what this says here is that after you do the training for the multifunctional matrix and initialize the reservoir with data from one, from one cycle, CA, and look at the long-term behavior in blue, it's when you remained on that cycle in orange is when you switched to the other cycle. In this pink color is when you the prediction decayed towards some aperiodic behavior. In black, it means that you decayed either towards some other limit cycle or you fell outside, the prediction fell outside some error criteria, which I'll come to in the next slide. Or in green is when you decay to a fixed point. What's probably uh, most distinctive about these pictures is that the relationship between row and multifunctionality is apparent here. As you, as you increase the amount of overlap, so as you make it more difficult for the reservoir to learn both attractors, both cycles, you need a larger memory. So as you're increasing the amount of overlap, row also needs to go up with it. And similarly, if, they're, if you have them completely overlapping, then you need quite a large row. Well, what this says as well is that I call this this Goldilocks effect, whereby if rho is too large, then you have chaos. And if rho is too small, you decay towards some different stable attractor. If you take the common blue region, uh, you'll get the regions of multifunctionality, of course, in this X in row plane. So the error criteria I have here is this roundness, which is an engineering term used in the machining of, of circular pipes which tells you the difference between the radii of the maximum and minimum circles needed to enclose and inscribe the predicted cycle. So this gives us a good idea of how good our prediction of the circle is. So if delta is really low, that means that we have a great prediction. And if delta is really high, it means we have a poor prediction. 
what this picture kind of tells us is it gives us an indication of where our prediction is best. So here, I, I of course, I, I take the maximum value of the roundness uh, for, for both attractors. So I, I take the maximum of either and I plot this here. And what this says is that when the attractors, when the circles are overlapping, uh, your best performance occurs closest to the edge of chaos. So this kind of, uh, this effect here at the edge of chaos is up for debate as to whether it's when you have the optimal performance of the reservoir. And it, it seems to be the case here that when we have uh, the problem uh, at its hardest point when the circles are overlapping, it occurs just prior towards you having chaotic dynamics in the, in the reservoir. But I suppose the most interesting thing about this picture is that we can reconstruct two completely overlapping cycles. So what's going on there? Uh, we, in this extreme scenario, uh, the reservoir can still be trained to exhibit multifunctionality. So this, this is something that uh, is quite interesting because the, as, if it was a single autonomous dynamical system, it wouldn't be able to do this, right? So they're, they're rotating in opposite directions and they're completely overlapping. Uh, that proves to be a very interesting thing to consider. Uh, so the next question I investigated was, how does the reservoir construct the basins of attraction from the perspective of the prediction state space? Uh, so what I do here is I pick a point in the XY plane and I drive the reservoir with that point up to a certain point up to, uh, in time until the reservoir dynamics gives you its response to that point. So it becomes kind of a representation of the XY point in the thousand dimensional state space. And then I initialize the trained reservoir, the multifunctional reservoir with that point, And I look at where the prediction goes to. And the blue points in this plane correspond to uh, falling onto a track onto circle CA and the orange points onto circle CB. So this gives us kind of some intuition as to what the basins of attraction look like for the case of two completely overlapping objects in state space. So this is when you get multifunctionality. It's also just as interesting to look at what happens just prior to multifunctionality in this case of overlapping training data. Uh, what I did next was I looked at lower row values where I didn't get multifunctionality. So just uh, for row smaller than the one in the previous picture, what you have here is you can reconstruct one attractor CB, but then you fail to reconstruct CA. But what's actually happening is that the, there's another attractor within the prediction state space. So you would think that here in this picture, you, you would only see orange, but you actually see uh, a lot of points being attracted towards this other limit cycle LC1. And there's another, uh, so if you decrease row further, what you see is another limit cycle being born so as you don't get, if you can't reconstruct either attractor, either limit cycle, you're actually getting two different limit cycles which exist behind the scenes. And then decreasing row even further, you have four fixed points which exist behind the scenes. So what's obviously apparent in these pictures is symmetry. And if you're interested in that, I can talk a bit more about that at the end of the talk. But we've looked at what happens for, uh, for, for low, lower values of row. Uh, so are these also evolving along some continual points, these untrained attractors? And when you look at the bifurcation diagram and you track and trace the behavior of these fixed points, you can see that they actually are what become, they actually become these limit cycles that we see at higher row values. And uh, what you kind of say from this is that the untrained attractors begin to further resemble the, the training data as row was increased. So this, this picture here kind of exposes the relationship between the training data and the behavior of the untrained attractors as we increase row. So, so here, um, the symmetry is also present. So if you, again, if you want me to speak more about that, then I'll come to that at the end. But it's, it's one thing to look at what happens for the lower row values. We also need to look at what happens at the higher row values. So just after we have multifunctionality. So taking a closer look at this type of chaos here, what we see is that, so in this picture, the last reconstructed attractor is CA. So here you have this kind of shadowed region where you have both uh, attractors 
desired attractors coexisting where you have multifunctionality and CA is the last attractor that you can reconstruct before you fail to do so. And what's actually happening here is if you look at the individual dynamics of each neuron in the network, you, be, you see that initially when you are able to reconstruct CA, the neurons fire with a very low number of unique local maxima and that very quickly what happens is that the neurons begin to oscillate at a much larger number of unique local maxima, but it takes another while then before you actually get chaos appearing in the network. So if you take a closer look at the actual individual neurons and you plot the number of unique local maxima this way, so this is the same picture as this, but from a different perspective, what you see here is that uh, initially all the neurons are firing with, uh, you know, with quite a, a low number of unique local maxima, then one of them starts to fire with an increased number of local maxima and then two and three and four and so on until the whole, this entire behavior spreads throughout the network. And it's only then later on that you actually get chaotic dynamics occurring. So some final remarks. Uh, during this talk, we've uh, covered the results of three different papers and introduced the multifunctionality, talked about reservoir computers, we spoke about these untrained attractors for a while. Then we discussed the effects of symmetry and multifunctionality and discussed at length the effects of overlap and multifunctionality. So what's next, right? Um, so what I'm currently interested in, I'm working with Yoshka and Christoph on uh, what are the limits of multifunctionality? So how much multifunctionality can a multifunctional reservoir computer have? So, so how many attractors can you, can you learn? We've seen that it can learn four uh, in this talk, we can actually learn a lot more. And that's something that we're currently investigating. So we're also looking into the effect of different topologies. So are certain topologies of the reservoir more suited towards multifunctionality and how many neurons are needed? So, so if, if the leech in the very first example is able to achieve multifunctionality with only a handful of neurons, then we should obviously aim for that as well with the reservoir uh, for it to become um, multifunctional in the same way that the leech can with only very few neurons. I'm also uh, looking into excitable network attractors of limit cycles. So uh, it would be a model for multifunctionality with Andrea Cheney. So you might have seen his paper uh, on excitable network attractors of fixed points. We're hoping to step that up a notch and investigate the effect of uh, limit cycles and chaotic attractors. And also, so this edge of chaos uh, is something that featured in this talk. All hope is not lost at the edge of chaos. Uh, there's actually another dynamical state here, which is very interesting to look at when you have multifunctionality, which is chaotic itinerancy. So this is interesting uh, from a dynamics perspective because what you have here is that, so you have multiple attractors in the state space and as your prediction decays uh, beyond the edge of chaos, you're actually, what we observe happening is you can wander between the different attractors in the system. So that's what also what we're studying next. So I'll leave it there. Uh, thank you for the, your attention. Thank you for this opportunity to talk here today. I've had a great time preparing these slides. And if you have any questions, then I'm welcome to answering some. And you can also email me here. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the nice talk. Uh, any questions? I mean, just a general question, what, what are the other, I and mean, this is the first time actually I see this kind of work of uh, multifunctionality uh, in uh, machine learning. So I'm not sure uh, what, what is the state of the art, but what, what would be the other methods? I mean, are there other methods that are de dealing with this kind of problems? Or, because it seems a very, uh, very interesting, yeah. So, um, no, <laughs> uh -huh. uh, to maybe, put it like that there's so there are some some things which are very similar of course though um so some multifunctionality is is 
training the reservoir a single system to perform more than one task. But there are some, some very similar uh, problems out there. Um, I see some papers lately uh, which involve um, uh, learning global, uh, inferring global dynamics about, about the reservoir. So, so moving between translations of Lawrence attractors, which was a recent paper I saw by uh, Bassett's group. Um, there's uh, so. Um, so what did they use? Did they also use a reservoir computer or something else? Yeah, so the reservoir, so yeah, why, why the, so that, that's translating the reservoir, but the reservoir computer is actually particularly suited to this task because the training, so of, of how the training works. So the, the readout is memoryless. And uh, that means that it, it, it doesn't kind of, uh, the weights are not specific to a single attractor when you're training, they can become sort of general in some sense. Yeah, there's another question on the chat. Um, okay, so hi Juan. Um, have you explored the time it takes to switch between the different functionalities? So is this uh, about the edge of chaos? Um, uh, when, you're, when you're switching autonomously? Okay, so um, this is uh, currently what I'm investigating. And so, yeah, it, it actually depends on the nature of the attractor. So what I find is that it's easier to switch between chaotic attractors than it is to switch between limit cycles. Uh, and I need to think more about it uh, to really understand it, but there is this uh, th 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 it, th th this effect of chaotic itinerancy. It, it's it's quite similar to intermittency, I believe. So, uh, I, yeah, I haven't explored it fully yet, but I, I do feel it will be something of interest, definitely. Andrew. This is Luke McCor again. Hi, Lou. Hi. Uh, I was just looking at chaotic itinerancy that uh, reminded me, uh, maybe it's uh, heteroclinic points that are connected. Uh, you had a lot of fixed points in this, some of the work. And if they become hyperbolic points, you can get wandering from one to the other. You know, you have stable directions, they pull, get pulled in and then they hang around a point and then they get pushed out by an unstable direction. Uh, I don't, I can't think of names right away, but I think Marty Golubitsky is one. There are a number of people who work on that. You might be able to check that out and see if that's what's going on. Just a thought. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Cause it, uh, it's something that I am currently investigating in fairness and yeah, it, that, that idea we're, we're tossing that around currently. So oh, when, good. The, when the prediction, when the prediction decays, um, these guys, they become kind of more involved uh, in, in the system and to be able to pinpoint the point at which in, in this big, in the big state space as to when these excitable connections come about, that that will be essential to really maybe controlling this and having uh, this idea of, you know, just figuring out how easy you can switch and and when you can switch, of course, and is there some regular pattern to when the switching occurs? So, so thank you. Uh, yeah. I will investigate yeah. that further now. Yeah. Other questions? All right, it looks like there are no further questions. Okay, thanks again for the very nice talk. It was very uh, interesting to have uh, this uh, new direction. So it's very good. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, take thank care. You everyone. Much, guys. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, bye. Thank you.